Okay, well, welcome back everyone. Now let's get straight into today's class. There's quite a lot to get through. Um, so I wanna get, give it, do it justice. So let's get straight into it. Now today we're dealing with two topics. We're really focusing on the one. I'm just gonna start to touch on audit sampling, but the focus today will be on internal controls. Now last week, we talked about the five different types of audit tests. One of them was a test of controls or called controls testing. So we're gonna focus on that element today and we're gonna to touch on substantive testing more so next week. All right, uh, but audit sampling I'm gonna to touch on at the end of today's class if there's time. If not, that's all good. I'll do that one next week as well. But the focus today is on controls in particular. Now, I wanna show you again a more conceptual way of how everything kind of links in together. So allow me to draw you a diagram. All right, how it works is this, and we've started discussing this last week, but I'm gonna to introduce to you two new terminology when it comes to controls. The first thing to be very mindful of, ladies and gentlemen, is the very beginning of the audit. We always start the same way. We start by gaining an understanding of the business. Now, the thing that I would like you to add to this is when you gain an understanding of the business, that includes gaining an understanding of the internal control structure within the business, okay? The internal control structure and the systems within the business. That's included within that gaining an understanding stage. Now it is based on this, under <coughs> excuse me, based on this understanding, ladies and gentlemen, that we go ahead and we do step two, which is the risk assessment stage. Now with risk assessment in particular, we assess control risk. Remember, control risk is the risk that the controls within the business will not prevent a material misstatement, nor will they detect and correct the, state, the misstatement before it hits the financials, all right? So how do we determine what this control risk assessment is? We determine this based on our understanding of the controls. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the key point that we haven't talked about before. We get to this assessment of low, medium or high based on, purely based on how the controls look. Ladies and gentlemen, write that down. We are making an assessment purely based on how the controls look. Now, what is that called in red? That is called the design of the controls. Because remember, at this stage, you haven't tested anything yet. You don't know if the controls work or not. You are purely making an assessment of the control risk purely based on how the controls look. What do we call that? We call that design effectiveness. You are assessing control risk as low, medium or high based on how the controls look or how they appear to be designed. Okay, now that's really important because if they don't look good, you're not going to go ahead and test them. You're only going to go ahead and test the controls if they look good. The designs look effective. And by the way, what does that mean? That means low control risk or medium control risk, all right? Remember, control risk comes down to how good you think the controls are. If you think they're good, control risk is lower. If you think the controls are poor or they don't have controls, that's when you assess them as being high, all right? So based on how the controls look, we get to this assessment. And based on this assessment, if we say low risk or medium risk, that's when we go ahead and test the controls. Ladies and gentlemen, what's the focus there? We're trying to determine if the controls are operating effectively. They operate effectively. What does that mean, guys? Do they do what they're supposed to do? Now, this is really important. The distinction you need to be able to make <clears throat> is between design effectiveness and operating effectiveness. Design effectiveness is how the controls look. Operating effectiveness is do the controls do what they are supposed to? And you can only determine that, guys, by testing them. So that's the distinction there. You gain an understanding, you assess, and then if you assess the controls to look good, you go ahead and test them to determine if they are good. That's the connection there. So half of today's topic will focus on how we determine if the controls look good or not, 
And then the second half, we'll look at operating effectiveness, how we test them. And guys, I've got a practical example today, a practical exercise, so you can kind of make this link uh, as we go along. All right? So the question then becomes, well, what's internal control? What is a control? Ladies and gentlemen, a control, I've said this to you before, let's say it one more time, a control is any task, activity or check that the business has in place to make sure processes take place correctly. So it's any check, any activity, any task that the business has in place to make sure that a process takes place correctly. Now, in particular, here's the link to what you've got in your slides. In particular, a control is anything that the business has in place to help the business make sure their financial reports or their financial reporting is reliable. It's anything the business has in place to try to make sure that their operations are conducted effectively and efficiently. It's anything that the business has in place to make sure that they are complying with the laws and regulations they need, need to comply with. Now, that's a very general kind of description of what controls are. What I want you all to remember is this. Our focus, our focus in audit is on the controls that, number one, link or relate to financial reporting because our focus is the financial report. And secondly, remember, for our purposes, controls are anything the business has in place to prevent a misstatement or detect and correct a misstatement before it gets to the financial report. All right? Now, here are some examples. Ladies and gentlemen, passwords. A password is, a password is a control. It's trying to deal with the risk of unauthorized people gaining access to a system or to a program. Security passes. Security passes that we use at our UTS, for example, that's a control. It's trying to deal with the risk of unauthorised people gaining access to buildings they shouldn't have access to. Manager approval. Getting or needing management to approve something before it's processed is trying to deal with the risk that the incorrect thing is processed or something, uh, the, that something is processed that's actually fraud. Notice the consistent thing that I said three times. Controls are there to deal with, write this down, risks. A control is there to deal with a risk, okay? Any control that you identify is there to deal with or tackle a particular risk and we're trying to either eliminate the risk or reduce it, all right? So that's our focus. Now, a key concept you all need to really know, and this is quite interesting because people often get confused here, but the, the responsibility for establishing, for establishing and maintaining the internal control structure within a business, guys, it's the responsibility of management. It's not the responsibility of auditors, it's the responsibility of management. They are the group of people who have to make sure that they have designed internal control system for the, for the business and that they maintain those controls. What does maintain mean? It means you need to make sure that you monitor the controls, that they're working, and also if the business changes, you're updating your controls as well. Now again, key point guys, it's the responsibility of management. Remember the word that we've kept on using when, when it comes to control risk. I said to you continuously that the auditors come in and we assess control risk. What does assess mean? Assess means it's not, we don't control it. We look at it and we determine, do we think that this is low risk, medium risk or high risk? It is not the auditor's responsibility to put in place the controls. That's management's responsibility. What our responsibility is, is to come in and test the controls to see if they work. All right. So please be mindful of that distinction. Second thing you need to know is what this paragraph is trying to explain, and that is that controls are very rarely 100% effective. Very rarely. It is very rare that a control will eliminate a risk 100%. And the reason for that is we have what's called inherent limitations when it comes to controls. And I'm, going to, I'm about to talk, talk to you about those in the next slide. But remember, one more time. It's very rare for a control to be 100% effective and to eliminate a risk completely. Again, it's because there are limitations. What are the limitations? Ladies and gentlemen, go to your next slide. 
Now I'm going to focus on only some of these. But probably the most important reason why controls are not 100% <coughs> effective in that they don't eliminate a risk 100% is because controls, guys, must be cost effective. What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, controls cost money. The better the control, the more expensive it is. Now, where is the control going into? A business. What's a business all about? Making money. Right? So when it comes to the decision of should we implement this control, the question always comes down to one key thing. Well, will the cost of me implementing this control, will that cost be lower than the benefit I get from it? A, a control will only be implemented in a business, guys, if the benefit will outweigh the cost. And because of that one key reason, it is very rare to have controls <coughs> that eliminate a risk completely. Why? because those types of controls, those really good controls, are expensive. And it's very rare that a business will determine, oh, the cost is worth the benefit. Let me give you an example. Of, I, I raised this in my post-grad class earlier in the week. And I said to them, okay, think about Woolworths. Now, I want everyone here to think about the business of Woolworths. What's the number one risk that Woolworths has? Theft, okay? So I said to my students in my postgraduate class, I said, okay, what can you think of as a control to absolutely eliminate the risk of theft at Woolworths? Now, they named a bunch of different things. There were two top answers, which I thought were really interesting. One of them was, you know the x-ray machines you go through at the airport? They said implement that. At the end of each of the, the store, the, the, um, what's it called? When they leave after the checkout, have the x-ray machines there. Because if they've got anything in their pockets or in their bags, it'll pick up on it. I was like, okay, that's interesting. The other one is probably my favourite. They said, have a security guard for every single shopper. So think about it, you're shopping and the security guard's just like, hmm, the whole time. Hmm, you're going to get that? Okay, cool. Aren't you on a diet? Okay, cool. Yeah? Now think about it. Both of those things would 100% eliminate the risk of theft. But would they be cost effective? Yes or no? No. Controls cost money. The better the control, the more expensive it is. So the reason why you don't have controls that would absolutely eliminate the risk is because they're too expensive and the business doesn't see the benefits at, as outweighing the costs. So that's what this first point is trying to highlight. Second thing, guys, as long as you have humans, we talked about this earlier in terms of what happened in the, in the tutorial this morning, as long as you have humans involved in a process, there's a risk of error. Why? We get sick, we get tired, we make mistakes. So as long as you have humans involved in a control and the conduct of that control, there's a risk of something going wrong. Now remember, we're not gonna make mistakes all the time, but we can make mistakes sometimes. And as a result, it's an inherent limitation of control. Circumvention of controls through collusion. Ladies and gentlemen, collusion is when two or more people work together to circumvent or go around a control for personal gain. So two or, people work, two or more people work together in a business to com com commit fraud, for example. Now, collusion is really interesting. I'm going to talk to you about a particular control that businesses put in place called SOD. Oops. SOD is separation of duties. You might know this as segregation of duties. You would have heard about it in MDC and other subjects. Now, separation or segregation of duties comes down to the fact that we try to get, or we try to split the responsibilities for a process, we split it between different employees. We have different employees involved in the conduct of a process. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the intention behind this control is we don't want any single employee in a position to conduct a fraud and cover it up right? That's why you have different people who can access the goods compared to the person that does the journal. You don't want anyone in, this, in a position to conduct a fraud and get away with it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we have in businesses, probably one of the, the key controls is separation of duties. Now, here's the thing. That's an awesome control, but it's still not 100% effective. Why? Because you can't eliminate the risk of collusion. If the right people get together, it's going to happen, right? As much as you put different people in the process, if those different people get together, they can carry out a fraud. So with collusion, the risk of collusion, you can never eliminate, but you can reduce it through controls such as this one, okay? 
Another one is abuse of responsibility. What I would actually refer to this as is management override. Management override. If management have the ability to override a control within the business or within the, the process or within the, the system, that's an issue. Now, you might be thinking, okay, give me an example. Let me give you an example. ANZ, so a bank. If you go to the bank and you apply for a credit card or you apply for a loan, they will do what's called a credit check, right? What does that mean? They will look at your financial history to determine whether they want to give you a credit card, whether they want to give you a loan, whether you're able to pay it back. Now, if a manager is able to go into the system and override this check, that's a limitation. Why? Well, they could have gone in and override, to override this control for a reason that's justified, but if they're able to do it, What's to stop them from doing it? Sorry, what's to stop them from doing it for a reason that's not justified? What's to stop them from going into the system and cancelling this control for their friend? Okay? So as long as there is a situation where management has the ability to override a control, that's a limitation of the control. It could be great, but if there's an ability for someone to go in and, and not or and to override it or to circumvent it, that's an issue. Okay, so these are just a list of reasons why controls are often not 100% effective, all right? Now, as I said, our focus as auditors, we focus on the controls relating to financial reporting. So there are controls in the business relating to many different areas, OH&S, making sure that, uh, that uh, employees are taking leave regularly, things like that. We, our focus is on the controls that relate to financial reporting. Okay, the controls involved in the accounting process, the controls involved in the inventory process, the things that will ultimately have an impact on the financial report. Ladies and gentlemen, information technology, now you've all seen this, particularly your generation has seen this. More and more technology is used in the conduct of business. Hell, more and more technology is used in the conduct of life, right? As a result of that, it's got its benefits and its risks. Now, probably one of the key benefits of the use of, uh, let me change the colour, the use of technology in business is that it's greatly improved the effectiveness and the efficiency of business. Now, more than ever before, businesses are able to process large data, yeah? And they can process that large data in less time and at less cost. Awesome benefit. Here's another benefit. What do we say about humans? They get sick, they get tired. Computers don't. They don't get sick, they don't get tired. So there's benefits in terms of using technology. However, there are also risks. By using, and this is an interesting point, and this I can tell you firsthand I've seen in businesses, as great as technology is, one of the biggest issues that we now face is over-reliance. There's so much over-reliance on, on technology now, particularly in business. So for example, let me give you a story. I went to a client a few years ago and I said, all right, we do this thing called a walkthrough, and I'll mention this later, but we do a walkthrough where we sit down and say, okay, so how does the process work? So I'm not even kidding you. The client turned around and said, oh, just the system does it. And I said, okay, well, how does the system do it? And they looked at me, I don't know, the system just takes care of it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an issue. Because if you don't know how the system works, how are you going to know when the system isn't working? Yeah, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the over-reliance that's now placed on technology is a risk. Here's one more thing, and this actually has happened, I've seen this before. Over-reliance on systems and not knowing how it works, that's a problem. But also systems, they don't get tired, they don't get sick, but they can have programmed errors. What does that mean? Let me give you an example of this. There was a situation in a business where every single invoice that the, that the business generated was off by three cents. Three cents. So at the time, they were like, well, it's, it's three cents. It's not material. Stealth, okay? Material, cool. It's not material. But here's the thing. If it's off by three cents, every single transaction is off by three cents, that's going to start getting material really quickly. Because if you have millions and millions of transactions, that's going to get to a number that is pretty big. Now, here's the problem. With humans, if we make a mistake, we'll make a mistake here and there. If there's a programmed error in your system, and it's happening every single transaction, that's a really big problem, 
Okay? And again, that linked back to the over-reliance, massive problem. So IT, technology, has its benefits. It also has its risks. One more thing, guys. It's only since technology has become such a big part of our world that we've had fraud happen and hacking. Again, risks of using technology. So benefits and risks. You've got to be mindful of that. Now, there are five components of an internal control structure. These five that you can see on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to read your textbooks. You need to know these five elements. I'm going to touch on some aspects of each. And in particular, I'm going to focus on this one more so than, than the others. But you need to know these five elements. Please make sure you're reading up on this to solidify your understanding. So let's get into it. Control environment. Ladies and gentlemen, this, the most simple way for me to uh, describe the control environment to you is it's the tone and the attitude of the organisation, oh, that's not useful attitude, of the organisation to controls, right? Here's some questions you would ask. Number one, do you have a code of ethics? If the business has a code of ethics, it's more likely that they care about controls, making sure processes are happening correctly. Do they have internal control department? Do they have an audit committee? All of these things would demonstrate the tone or the attitude that the business has towards controls. Here's another. What's the attitude or the approach that management takes or the board takes? Is it quite aggressive or are they quite um, inclusive in terms of making decisions? Do they put a lot of pressure on their salespeople to hit their targets or is it more relaxed? All of these elements, and I'll let you have a read of this yourself, but all of these elements give us an indication of how does the... the company feel about controls? Do they think it's important or not? Now, again, we need to understand this because this will link into our control risk assessment, okay? Risk assessment. Organisations, our clients, they also do risk assessment for themselves. Remember, it's a business. They want to look at how their business is performing within the environment. They do risk assessment just like we do risk assessment. You might remember things like SWOT analysis. Yeah, that's a risk assessment measure that businesses do. So what we care about as auditors is we want to look at, well, how often do they conduct risk assessment for themselves? Who is involved in that process? How do they actually do it? Is it a matter of just doing SWOT analysis or do they do some form of statistical analysis as well? Okay. This is the key one, control activities. Remember, before I go anywhere into this, a control is any task any activity, any check that the business has in place to make sure a process is happening correctly, all right? Why do we get managers to approve? To make sure that it was an actual authorised transaction. Why do we have security passes? Why do we have passwords? It's an access issue. So a control is any task, activity, procedure, um, check that the business has in place to make sure processes are happening correctly. Now, before I go anywhere, guys, remember a control, oops, every control is linked to a risk. Every control is trying to deal with a risk. Now, when I say it's trying to deal with the risk, it's either, it's either trying to prevent the risk, okay, or it's trying to minimise the risk in some way. Please be mindful of that connection. I'm going to bring this back in a, little, in a little bit, okay? Now, when it comes to controls, there are five different categories of controls. That's what you see on the screen. So let's go through each one. First one, we talked about this earlier, is adequate separation of duties, SOD. You might have heard of this as segregation of duties. But basically what it is is exactly what the word says. You are separating the duties within a process, now, if you want greater detail, remember what I said, first of all, the idea or the intention, the objective behind this control, and by the way, it's a really good control that you'll find in almost all organisations. The idea behind it is you don't want anyone in, the, in a position to commit a fraud and cover it up. So you often have people, as part of a process, you'll have different people who have custody of the asset. What does that mean? Access. So the people who have physical access to a product or to the inventory, they will be different to the people who authorise the sale. 
for example. And both of those people or groups will be different to the accounting team who records the transaction. Guys, let me give you an example, sales. A customer comes in, they put in a sales order or they, they, put in a, yeah, they put in an order for something that they would like to buy. The person who approves that order or authorizes that order is, so by the way, that's this person, that person would be different to the people who then prepare the order in the warehouse. And both of those groups will be different to the accounting team who records that transaction. Different people are involved in the process. Why? You want to separate the duties to reduce the risk of one person having the ability to do something naughty and cover it up. Okay? So in sales, you want the people who have access to the goods to be separate to the people who actually authorise the sale, and you want both of them to be separate to the accountant. With purchases, the same thing. The people in the business who actually say, oh, we need to buy this, they should be different to the people who receive the, pro the, the goods or whatever it is that's been purchased. And again, both of them, bless you, should be different to the people who record it. These are the key, key three elements you want to be separated. Remember, the responsibility for a certain process is spread across a number of employees. That's what this is about. But remember, as good as this is, it does not eliminate the risk of collusion. It doesn't eliminate it. It reduces it, but it doesn't eliminate it. Because remember, if this person, this person, and this person got together, it could happen. But the more people you have involved, the less likely this is to take place. The second category, ladies and gentlemen, is proper authorization. Now, in business, the best example of this is we have what's called uh, authority limits. Authority limits, what does that mean? It means, let me just give you one example of it. A junior within an organization might have the ability to authorize uh, a purchase up to $1,000. A manager can approve up to $10,000. A director can approve up to $50,000 and anything above $50,000 goes to the CFO, right? That's authority levels. What's the intention? The intention is to ensure that individuals are only able to operate within their given authority. That's why you have authority limits. By the way, you could also call it approval limits because it's the limits you're using to approve a transaction. Very important, very important. Next one is adequate records. Now, I'm just going to add an element to that. Adequate records and documentation. Okay. Documentation and records are absolutely critical. Why? Well, from an audit perspective, it's these documents that form what we call the audit trail. What's the audit trail? The audit evidence you end up collecting. It's the supporting documentation that we look at to support the assertions and the testing that we conduct. So it's really important that a business has these in place. Now, there are certain characteristics and controls that we see that I want to highlight to you. The first one is this. A lot of the documents and records that a business uh, generates, they're pre-numbered consecutively. What do I, what do I mean? Invoices that the business generates will be invoice number one, invoice number two, invoice number three, invoice number four, and so on. They are pre-numbered consecutively. Purchases that we make to our suppliers, it'll be purchase number one, purchase order number two, purchase order number three, and so on. The reason why that's really important, number one, it's important to have documents because that's the evidence. Number two, why is it important to be numbered? Guys, if they're numbered, you can go back and check them. If we look at the purchase orders and we find purchase order number one, number two, number three, and then number five, we found the one that's missing. This helps us, here's your link. This is a really good control to have because of what it links us to, what it helps us support, actually I'll do it here, is it helps us when, when we conduct a completeness check. That's your assertion, write this down. Completeness check because we can go back through the records and determine and confirm that all the numbered documents were there. Everything is complete. It's when a number is missing that we're like, uh-oh, what happened to this one? Has it been recorded, yes or no? So it helps us with the completeness check. So it's a really good um, control to have. Another thing that we see is when it comes to documentation, can we close that door, please? When it comes to documentation, Businesses try to make sure that documents are prepared at the same time as the transaction. What does that mean? 
making sure that, for example, uh, the sales invoice is generated straight away once the customer gets the stock. Why? Because it reduces the risk of misstatement if it's done straight away, okay? Because the, you have all the information right in front of you. Now, in addition to this, I wanted to add one more element. And this is more because practically, when you guys enter into business and industry, you're going to see this. As I mentioned earlier, we do use technology quite a lot. So I wanted to give you an example of this in the context of technology. So for example, a particular control could be that when a customer order comes in, the person who receives it goes into the system, inputs the customer code or the customer's name into the system and what they want to order, so in terms of the, the products that they want, and then what the system can automatically do is it can automatically put in the price of the, of the product. So based on the product code that the employee puts in, the system will automatically put in the price of the product. Now, how would the system know what that is? Guys, in real life, we have this thing, in real life, we have this thing in business called a price master, okay? And it's in the IT system. Now, what the price master is, it's basically a system or a document that lists all the products and each of the prices for each of those products. Now, this price master is uploaded into the system. So how it works is when a, uh, an employee puts in the details of what the customer wants, the system does not, listen to me very carefully, the system does not allow the employee to also put in the price. Rather, it says once you put in what product the customer wanted, I will automatically put in the price for you. Why? To make sure, here's your link, that it's accurate. Because it's based off the master file that's in the system. Now, what's the issue, or sorry, what's the, the risk we're trying to deal with here? Manual input of the price. What the IT system often does, and the controls in the IT system, we're trying to minimise the amount of manual input that employees have in the, in the system. Why? Because manual input, human error, risk, okay? Risk that they'll put in something wrong, or they'll intentionally put in something wrong to try to mess with the system. Okay, or to manipulate the information. So this is an example, by the way, this is a control. The control is you don't get to put in the price, the system will put in the price, you just have to put in the customer's details and the product that they wanted, okay? Does that make sense to you all? Head movement for me? Yeah? Okay, good. So this is what I mean. One of the biggest, uh, the key controls you'll see in, in, uh, in IT systems are things like this. They're trying to minimise the amount of manual input you put into the system, so they have a lot of automation, as you can see here. Physical control. You want to have controls that relate to access to assets and to records. So things that you will generally see are things, when it comes to physical precautions, safes. You'll see locks on the warehouse. You'll see security guards standing at the end of retail stores. You will see access controls in the form of passwords or security access cards. You'll also see backup procedures. Now, backup procedures is specifically IT related. Because all the information that the business now uses is usually in an IT system, it's really important to regularly back up the information. Why? If something happens to the business and all the documents burn down, you have, uh, you have a backup of the information. All right. So these are all controls we have over access. Independent performance checks relate to the performance of controls by people in the business must be checked. Are people doing the right thing? Now, a really good example of, of performance checks, guys, is management review. Managers reviewing things like the journals that, actually, I'll write this down. Managers reviewing, so management review. Managers reviewing the journal entries that have been recorded. Managers reviewing the bank reconciliation that has been prepared. Right? Here's the key. The person that is reviewing the control should be different to the person who prepared the information. All right? And that's what this point is trying to highlight. So the verification should be independent from the individual who originally prepared the data. And that makes logical sense. And that's usually why it's management. 
that does review and it's the junior staff that does the preparation. So you have that different people involved in that checking process. Now, the fourth thing that we look at as part of internal control is information and communication systems. Now, with this one, essentially, the key thing here is we want to gain an understanding of the system that the business uses to collect information, right? What do I mean? Well, from an accounting, concept, or, or, from an accounting perspective, I should say, what accounting system do they use? Most organisations that I have been working with, they use SAP which is an accounting software. If you want to look at a smaller business, they might use MYOB or they might use Xero, okay? So we want to get an understanding of what information system they use to capture the data within the organisation. The fifth and final element of internal control systems is monitoring. Now, this one, really important, really, really important because I'm just going to do this. The reason why it's important is because it's not enough for a business to just have controls in place. Because the thing is, just because you have controls doesn't mean they're working. You need to regularly monitor the controls within the business to make sure, and here's the word, to make sure it is operating effectively, right? Remember, that's what we're trying to conclude about when we do uh, controls testing. So are they operating effectively? Are the controls doing what they are supposed to be doing. Now, management and the business itself, they need to continually monitor the controls. They need to monitor the quality of the controls and if it's actually indeed uh, operating the way it was designed. Here you go, link those two together. Design is what it just looks like. Operating is how it's performing. Is it operating the way it was designed to operate? Now, they need to regularly do that test, do that check. Why? Because guys, it's not about make, or it is partly, it's partly about making sure that the controls are working, but it's even more important to identify when it's not working. Because when it's not working, so if the answer to this question is no, that's when there's a risk of material misstatement creeping into the financials. So that's why it's really important to monitor from a business perspective, okay? Is the control doing what it's supposed to be doing? If it's not, that's when there's a high risk of error and fraud. So we need to deal with it. So when you monitor, and, and please do make this note, monitoring is about checking that it's working and taking corrective action when it's not. So it's not just by saying, oh, it's, it's not working anymore. That's a bummer. It's about doing something about it, correcting the issue. Is it about adjusting the control, putting in a better control? What's the issue? So management must monitor. That's the fifth component of our internal control systems. Again, it's, it's not really, well, sorry, it's really important to not only have controls in place, but that the business monitors them as well to make sure that they're okay. All right. Now, again, I'm going to come back and recap what we discussed at the very beginning. That is, remember, step one, actually I'll do it here. Step one is to gain an understanding of the business, which includes an understanding of the internal control systems. Remember the five elements we just went through, okay? It is based on that understanding that we come up with an assessment. Uh, do this in green. We, did, we come up with an assessment of whether the control risk is low, medium, or high, again, based on how the controls look, ladies and gentlemen, design effectiveness. So now that we have an understanding of them, how do they look and therefore what is my assessment? Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a question. If the control risk is low, are we going to test the controls, yes or no? Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do that again. Yeah, I need more than two people responding. So if the control risk is low, are we going to test the controls, yes or no? Okay, what about if it's medium? What about if it's high? Awesome. Okay, fantastic. That's absolutely true. You would, only, you would only go ahead and test the controls if the risk was low or medium. If the risk is high, so if you think that based on how it looks, the, risk of the, inter, sorry, the control risk is high, you're not going to go ahead and test them. That's a waste. If you don't, if you don't think they look good, why would you waste your time testing them? In that case, you would go straight to substantive testing. So the only time you go and you do uh, controls testing is when the control risk is deemed to be low or medium. And you go ahead and you complete your controls testing to gain comfort that yes, the controls are indeed operating effectively or not. So remember, 
you look at how they're designed, you, you come up with your initial assessment, you then test the controls to see if they're actually doing what they are supposed to be doing. Ladies and gentlemen, a big skill that you need to start developing is how you're going to design a test to see if the controls are working or not. Now, before anyone freaks out over that, really straightforward, because once you know what the control is supposed to be doing, it's pretty straightforward to figure out how to test it. If the control is supposed to come up with the price automatically, test that it does, or it's coming up with the right price. Okay, so once you know what the control is supposed to do, it's pretty straightforward to make the link to a test. So I wouldn't stress about it, but we need to develop that skill. So how do we gain an understanding of the internal controls within the business? Well, we, look at, we can look at our previous experience with the client. So previous controls testing that we have done, what's been the outcome of that? Have the controls been operating effectively or have they not been? Have we found weaknesses? We can make inquiries. We can talk to them. We can read or we can inspect documents, policies, procedures that the business has. We can look or observe, we can watch uh, employees within the business conduct certain activities. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a reason that I have bolded and underlined those terms. Those are the terminology that you need to be using. When it comes to designing a test, a lot of it is you need to make sure you're using the right terminology. For example, you don't say look at, you say inspect, all right? You don't say watch these people, you say observe these personnel. So it's about using the right terminology. And by the way, that's how I'm gonna be marking you as well. So I'm giving you advice right now, okay? In saying that, one, and again, let's bring it back to a more practical setting. One of the biggest and most important tasks that we do, and I mentioned this earlier, it's a walkthrough. Now, a walkthrough, as the name suggests, is literally when we sit with the client and we walk through the process step by step. So we say, okay, so how do you process this particular transaction? They say, well, I put the information in here. And you say, okay, then what? And they say, okay, and then it goes to this page and I have to put in the information here. Okay, then what? So you literally walk through the process step by step and that's how you gain an understanding of how it works. Here's the key. That's how you also gain an understanding of the controls in the business, in that process, how they look in terms of their strengths and also the weaknesses. And that's really important because once you identify the controls, you can go ahead and test them. But if you notice that a lot of them are weak, that's gonna impact on your control risk assessment as well, which will impact on whether you test them or not. So the best thing here is you do a walkthrough to gain the understanding, and then from there you determine what testing you want to be doing. So how do we document our understanding? There are three main ways that we document our understanding. The first one is through a narrative, and that's where we write a step-by-step -step description of the process in words. Narrative is a story, okay? It's from the very beginning of the process all the way to the very end. Now, it's comprehensive, it's detailed, it's very step-by-step, -step, very, very detailed, which is great. But because it's so comprehensive and because it's so detailed, it takes a long time. So it's really time consuming to read and to, and to write. As a result of that, probably the most common procedure that we do is a flowchart. Now, flowchart, it shows us the process, but it does so visually. Right? It depicts a visual diagram of how the process actually works. And I'm going to show you that in a little while for uh, the practical exercise we're going to do. So because it's, pretty more, it's much more, um, well, it's a diagram. It's easier to, to read and easier to interpret, but again, less detailed. The last one we do is internal control uh, questionnaire. Now, this is basically when we have a preset list of questions. We sit with the client and we say, okay, question number one. Do you have a code of ethics? Yes or no, write it in. Question number two, do you have this and this? So it's a preset or yeah, predetermined list of questions. Now, it's good because it's already there. All you have to do is sit with the client and answer the question. Here's the problem. A lot of clients are unique. Because these questions are preset, they're pretty generic. So they don't take into account the unique nature of a, of a, of a client, the unique nature of their business. So it's a little bit flawed in that regard. This is the most common one, and this is always really good because it's detailed. This one I've literally only done once in my entire life, and it was really annoying, okay? And we had to add a bunch of information to it because it wasn't comprehensive enough, all right? Now, 
again, coming back and repeating these, these elements to you, we gain an understanding of the entity's internal control systems. We document the understanding. Remember, it is at this point that we are able to identify the existing controls within the business. That's when you identify strengths and weaknesses. Now, what I want to highlight to you at this point is this. Absence of a control is a weakness. Okay, what do I mean? Let me give you a really good example of that. An example of when a, a, control, a key control is not there is if you find out that it's the same person who is involved in the whole process for sales and cash collection. So it's the same person who gets the order, gets the inventory, sends it to the customer, uh, sends them the invoice and collects the money. If it's the same person doing this whole thing, that's a problem because that person is in a position to commit a fraud and get away with it. That's a lack of separation of duty, start using the terminology. So that's a, a, an absence of a key control and that would be a weakness, okay? So we wanna be identifying these things as we go along. Now, the other thing that we do at this point is we consider what we call compensating controls. Now, the best way for me to explain this to you is through a diagram. So get involved in this because this will, it's pretty straightforward once you understand it. But here's the issue. Actually, here's the situation. I told you that every single control deals with a what? Risk. So say we've got two risks, risk number one and risk number two. Now, in relation to these risks, let's just say we have three controls. So control number one, control number two, control number three. Now, the first control deals with risk number one, okay? The second control deals with both risk number one and risk number two. And the third control only deals with risk number two. Now, here's my question. Ladies and gentlemen, in this scenario, which of these controls am I more likely to want to test? What is it? Two, why? What's the word starts with an E? It's more efficient, absolutely, okay? So we would wanna test this one because it's actually covering both risks. It's more efficient to cover off on both risks by just testing the one control. Awesome, here's the thing. If we go ahead and we do this test and we find out that this control is not operating effectively, is there anything else I can do? Can I test anything else? Which ones? One and three. One and three. Ladies and gentlemen, one and three, they are what we call compensating controls. A compensating control is another control that's dealing with the same risk. So in the event that the control you're testing doesn't work out, you can test the other ones, the compensating controls, okay? Best way to think about it. So control number one and control number three, they are compensating controls. So in the event that the control number two doesn't work, we can kind of reshift our focus into testing those ones. Now remember, we assess control risk based on the design for effectiveness of the control system. It is based off of that that we assess control risk as low, medium or high. Now again, we've said this before, we then decide which strategy we're going to take for the audit. Are we going to, contain, are we going to uh, undertake controls testing or substantive testing? And again, you only go ahead and do controls testing if control risk is low or medium. If it's high, don't worry about controls testing, go straight to your substantive. Now, one more question. Is it possible for a control to look good, so design well, but not operating well? Yes or no? Yes. In that case, guys, you would shift. You would do the testing, you would get the results, realize you can't rely on the control, and you would shift to do more substantive testing. So please be aware of that process. Now, when we actually do gain the understanding of the, the controls and we do our testing, we get our results, we do communicate to the business, obviously, because it's their systems and we want them to understand what's happening. So we communicate our findings, and there's one more thing we communicate, recommendations for how they can improve. We wanna add value to our clients beyond just checking the numbers. So if we do find out areas where the controls are weak, we do try to uh, provide some recommendations for how they can improve. Now in saying that, there's two main parties that we would talk to. The first one, we've got the audit committee. 
and we would talk to the audit committee about any issues that we find. So if we find controls that are not working, we'll let them know. And the standard that deals with that is ASA 260. But we also contact and speak to management, and we do that through what's called a management letter. Now, a management letter, as the name suggests, it's a letter that we as the auditors, we write and we give it to management. And in that letter, we set out what our findings were, what the control strengths and weaknesses were, or the deficiencies is what we call them, but also the improvements that we suggest. Now, let me ask you a question. If we said to management, here are the issues that we found, and these are some recommendations on what you can do to improve, do they have to take on the recommendations, yes or no? No. Please be mindful of that. We can suggest recommendations to them, but remember, who is ultimately responsible for the internal controls? So it's their decision. It's their decision to take on what you say or not. Okay? Now think about it this way. If, they, if we identified a bunch of weaknesses in one year and we said, guys, you should improve on these, these are some suggestions, and they don't, in the next year, would control risk be higher or lower? It will be higher because we know they don't work. Do you see what I mean? So one year's results, it can influence the next year's. And I'm going to mention that in just a minute as well. Okay? So remember, what we want to do is we want to test the controls. Okay? We want to determine, based on the design, do they now actually operate the way that they are supposed to? Now, as I noted earlier, we use the same nine procedures that we talked about previously. Vouching, tracing, inspecting, observing, use the right terminology. And again, focus is on whether they are operating the way they are supposed to. So at this point, you want to make decisions regarding, well, what procedure should I use? Should I use inspecting? Should I use re-performing? What should I do? When should I perform the test? And how much testing should I do? Now, all of these questions and the answers to these questions will come down to the situation. And the more practice you do with these, the better you will get at it. Now, there is a practical ex exercise we're about to do, but there's just two more things I want to tell you before we get there. Some examples of procedures, as we've noted earlier, are we can talk to the client, we can inspect documents, we can observe activities, like them performing a bank reconciliation or them performing uh, an inventory count, and we can re-perform procedures as well. Now, remember what I noted to you earlier. Once you know what the control is supposed to do, it's pretty straightforward to design a test. Let me give you one example of that. Again, in the IT system, if you know that the um, employee has to put in the customer details, okay, as well as how much the, the order is, the order that the customer has placed, if you know that a particular control in the system is that the system will then do a credit check, you can test it. Now, let me give you an example of how this would work. So if the business tells you that, yeah, when you put in the customer details, every customer has what's called a credit limit. Now, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this to you all before, but a credit limit is the maximum amount you want to sell to a customer. So say, for example, Diego comes into the shop and the credit limit we have for Diego is $10,000, okay? Now, Diego comes in places an order. We put in the order into the system and the order is for $15,000. Now the system, in response to this, should the system accept or should the, the system reject this order? What do you think? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how the control should work. Therefore, how do you test it? You put in a bunch of test data or dummy orders into the system and you determine whether the system is responding the way it is supposed to. Right? So, for example, I know that, I don't know, another customer named Michelle, her credit limit is $5,000. So, I put in an order for Michelle for $6,000, knowing that the system should reject it. If the system does reject it, it's operating effectively. If it doesn't, it's not. Do you see what I mean? So, once you know what the control is supposed to be doing, it's pretty straightforward to design a test. Okay? And again, practice will make perfect here. Okay? Timing and extent, two things I'll mention here. Number one, rollover. Now, something I noted earlier was you can sometimes use the results of last year in this year's audit. It, what a rollover uh, situation, what it refers to is a situation where you know 
the systems and the controls within the business haven't changed since last year. They haven't changed at all since last year. If that's the case, then what you can do is what's called a rollover of your, of your uh, conclusions. What does that mean? It means that this year you can perform less testing and rather you can rely on the evidence you had from last year. Why? Because nothing changed. Okay. Now in saying that, sometimes uh, they tell you that you would perform zero testing and just strictly rely on last year's. No, you'd have to do at least some. You can't just completely blindly accept what last year's results were. So it would just reduce the amount of testing you do this year. Again, it's called a rollover because you're rolling over your conclusions. But in saying that, you would still want to do at least a little bit of testing of the systems to make sure it's okay. The final element I want to quickly go through is you want to gain comfort over the continuity of controls. Now, what does that mean? You want to make sure that the controls are not only working, but they were working for the whole time, okay? Continuity. You want it to be working for the whole period, the whole year that you want to rely on the controls for. So that's, and this is going to link back to something I'll tell you next week. So when we collect a sample, we collect a sample from the whole year, January, February, March, all the way to December or July all the way to June, depending on what the financial year is, okay? We want to collect a sample for the whole period. Why? Because we want to place reliance over the whole period. We want to make sure the control was working the whole time. Because here's the thing, if we find that the control was working in 11 months out of the year, but there was one month where it wasn't, in that one month, we have to do something else to gain comfort. In that one month, we might do some substantive testing, okay? We want to gain comfort over the whole period, so we test the whole period, all right? So just be mindful of that, that's called continuity. So let's apply this in a practical setting. Now, before I show you the flow chart, guys, these four rules are critical. The reason why it's critical is because this is how I'm going to mark you in your exam. Okay, so I'm going to mark you using these elements. Number one, guys, when you design a test, and by the way, this applies to controls testing as well as substantive testing. So in, in entirety, you have to use the appropriate technical name for the procedure. As I said earlier, you're not going to say look at, you're going to say inspect. You're not going to say watch the people, you say observe the employees or the personnel. You're not going to say, um, what was the other thing I was going to mention? Uh, oh, you're not going to say match the details here to here. You're going to say vouch the details or trace the details depending on which direction you're going. Use the correct terminology. It's really important, really important. And it's something quite easy that you can do. Use the client specific term, whatever. So the way that I always explain this is to speak using the client's language. Okay, whatever the client calls the document that you're referring to, you have to call it the same thing, all right? If they call it a uh, dispatch note, you call it a dispatch note. If they call it a purchase order, you call it a purchase order. Speak the language of your client. Be as detailed as possible. This is a reoccurring theme that we keep on bringing up when it comes to documentation. You have to be as detailed as possible when you design your test, ladies and gentlemen. If you just say vouch sales, you're not going to get the marks because you have to be as detailed enough so anyone can step into the situation, read what you have written and be able to follow those instructions without any confusion. That's the standard that I'm holding you all against because that's the standard in industry. Okay, so be as detailed as possible. Final, this is really important. Please make sure that your procedure is testing the right control and is aligned to the assertion you are testing. What do I mean? Recalculation is, is helping you get comfort over accuracy or valuation allocation. Procedures are linked to assertions. Physical examination of an asset is helping you with existence of that asset, okay? You gotta make sure that your procedures are aligned to the assertions that you're trying to test, okay? Procedure is linked to your assertion. Now, one more thing. Let me ask you this. Tracing. Tracing is from the beginning to the end. What assertion are you gaining comfort over? 
What is it? Completeness. What about when you're going backwards? Vouching is going backwards. What are the assertions there? People in the back, what are the assertions? And there's two of them. Existence. And what's the other one? Chris, what's the other one? You can do it. Yes. It, gotta love it when I know your names, huh? <laughs> Existence and occurrence, okay? You gotta know these. Guys, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm trying to make you remember, okay? I've been repeating these for three weeks now. So you need to make sure that you're making those connections. It makes your job easier. I'm just trying to help. All right, here we go. Let me quickly go through the process with you. You all have this as a reference point. After today, I don't want this to be the last time you look at this document. This is really good practice for you. What are the skills I need you to have? Number one, be able to read something like this as a diagram or if it was written in words. And the skills you need to have is to number one, understand the process. Number two, identify the controls. Number three, identify the weaknesses, all right? And then design your tests. So really important, good skill development, but you can only develop them by practicing. So here we go, how does it work? Essentially, what this process is showing you is it's a purchase process, right? So the business is trying to purchase goods that they need. So how it works is it starts with the purchasing department and the purchasing department, once they determine what needs to be purchased, they create what's called a purchase order. It's a document and it's usually pre-numbered sequentially. They, per they create a purchase order. That purchase order is then put into the system and the purchase order is signed by someone. It says here the PO is signed by staff. Now, just on this note, guys, that's a weakness because you don't know who the staff is, you don't know if they're appropriate or not. So that's something that you want to be uh, getting further information about. Now, once that purchase order is signed, it goes to the supplier and it goes to number one. Where's number one? Follow it, follow it, follow it, accounting department. All right, so we've made the order, well, we've placed the order with the supplier and we've given it a, a copy of it to accounting. Now, the goods are then received by the warehouse department. They receive the goods from the supplier and they complete what we call a receiving report. What's a receiving report? Exactly what it says. It's a report that documents the goods that have come through. So what the goods were and the quantity of the goods. So they complete a receiving report. That receiving report is then goes to number one, which is what? The accounting department. So the accounting department now has a copy of the original purchase order that remember was signed and the receiving report that was generated by the warehouse. Now what they also receive at this point from the supplier is the invoice. So what happens at this point in time is that the accounting department checks that all three of these documents they match. If they don't, so if the answer to that is no, they follow up. If the answer is yes, they do match, that's when they raise a request for payment, so to pay the supplier. Now that request is then approved and all of that goes into the system. So the, the payment is then processed. Now, this is something that does resemble what would happen in business and it makes logical sense. But your ability, again, once more, you need to understand the process, be able to identify the controls the potential weaknesses, and then go and test the controls, figure out how you would test them. So here's my question to you all. First things first, where in the purchasing department here, where's the control? What's the control that you see? What do you think? So you don't know that, there's no, it doesn't say. There's no, so based purely on what you see, where do you see a control? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, control number one, okay? The PO is signed by someone. That's an approval control, okay? We talked about that as, um, earlier in the lecture. Good. In the warehouse, move over to this one. Where's the control in the warehouse? What do you think? Say it again. You were right. What was it? Yes, good girl. They complete a receiving report. Guys, remember, documentation is really important. Documentation gives you something to refer back to. So once they receive the goods, they don't just pass it along, they document what they have received. Super important because that allows you to go back and check. Good. Then it goes to the accounting department. What's the, the first control you see? Yeah, the check. Probably the key control. Very good. And there's one more. Once they check, what happens? Good. Approved payment. So in this process, there are four controls, okay? You need to be able to identify that. 
Guys, heads up, anytime there's an approval or a signature of some kind required, that's a control. Okay, it's an approval control. You want documentation, so the fact that they're creating a report that sets out what they have received, that's a control. And clearly the matching element is a very big control. Okay, now just really quickly, and we'll probably touch on this again later, but the, the key thing I just wanna mention, um, just two things. Number one, this is too ambiguous and so is this. You don't actually, even though they're telling you that they're signed and they're approved, you don't know by who. Here, this only says by staff. It doesn't even say by a manager, right? So you wanna be investigating, well, who is the people approving? Is it within the, uh, the authority limits that you're aware of, right? Is the right people approving it essentially? Same thing here. Payment, who's approving it? Just says approved payment. Is it the same person as doing the check? Okay, so you wanna be asking these questions. Now, one more thing, and I'll just say this because it's important um, in terms of real life. Warehouse should be getting a copy of uh, the PO without the quantities. Now, listen very carefully. They should be communicating. Why? Because warehouse needs to know what to expect. So, a truck comes to the warehouse, gives them all these products, and they're like, uh, what am I, where is this coming from? So they need to know what to expect. Why did I say they should get a copy of it without the quantities? Because that's a check. If they check the quantities and they manually write what the quantities are in the receiving report, that makes this control more effective, okay? Because what's to stop them, if they know the quantity, what's to stop them from just saying, yeah, yeah, it's the same, and getting it through? All right, so it's little things like that that I want you to start thinking about. This subject is different to your other subjects because here you've got to start thinking like you're in business and that's how you develop. Trust me, that's how you develop, okay? So we've identified four controls. What I want you to do, oh, and we've identified some weaknesses, but what I want you to do, design tests, okay? So you, I've included in all of your ones uh, a table where you can start recording this. Just because I've got it on the screen, I've just separated it out. So you've identified the four controls. Here's the first one. The PO was signed by the staff members, okay? Now, what's a particular procedure you can do uh, in relation to this to test whether it actually happens? Well, guys, we know that the control is the PO is signed. So you take a sample of the POs, right? Purchase orders, take a sample of your purchase orders. Then what are you gonna do? Keywords, inspect the purchase orders to see if there's evidence of signature, evidence of being signed. And this is what I mean. Once you know what the control is supposed to do, it's pretty straightforward to link it to a test. But what do you need to be very mindful of? Using the correct terminology, taking a sample of the right thing and looking for the right element. Because here's the thing, in this case, evidence of being signed, take it one step further, Oops. by the right person, okay? It's not enough for just someone to have signed it, it should be someone who could have the authority to sign it, they should be the one who signed it, okay? So it's not enough to just see a signature, you wanna be able to link that to the right person, okay? Because here's the thing, anyone could sign it. That's not a good control. A good control is when it's signed by the right person, okay? Receiving report was completed. Now you wanna make sure that a receiving report was indeed completed. So what can you do? Well, what happened after the receiving report? Where did it go? Where did it go? Which department did it go to? Accounting, right? And then they took the receiving report and they took the PO and then what do they do with it? They matched it to, what was the third document? Look at your diagram, I just can't go back on mine. The invoice, right? So what, can, and then they paid it. So again, you have some options here. You can either take a sample of the invoice or the payments, okay? Because that happened after the report. So take a sample of either of these and then you want to vouch it back to make sure there was a receiving report. Okay, vouch back to receiving report. Now notice one thing, I did not say anything about checking the details. Because ladies and gentlemen, as soon as you start saying check the details were the same, you're doing a substantive test. Wrong focus, okay? 
A control, remember, a control test is making sure the process happened correctly. A substantive test is when you're looking at the details. So if I was taking a sample of the invoice or the, or the payments and I was vouching back the quantities, the product, the price, that's a substantive test. I'm not doing that here. Here, all I'm doing is I'm vouching it back to say there was a receiving report. I'm not looking at the details of the report. I'm just looking at the fact that there was one, okay? And then you'll do substantive testing in the next step. So just be mindful of that. The matching one, same thing applies. If you start looking at matching the details, you're doing a substantive test. So just be mindful. What you're actually, if you're looking at this particular um, element as a controls test, all you're trying to see is there was there some form of evidence that the match happened. Evidence that the match happened. Now remember, when a particular task is completed, there should be some evidence of the task being completed. What do I mean? Well, if you have those three documents, right, that you're matching, there should either be like a tick, there should either be a signature or a stamp or something that denotes the fact that these three documents were matched. Now, what you'll often find in industry, and again, apologies, I can't go back because it will stuff up the recording, but if you go back to your diagram, what you'll notice is in the accounting column, those three documents were matched in the accounting department and often they will be filed together. So they'll be stapled and filed together. So your ability to go back and do this check is a bit easier because they'll all be together. And on the front page, you'll either see like a signature or a stamp um, or a cover page that says the match was done or a tick or something. But you need to have some form of evidence to give you comfort that that particular task was performed. Are we okay so far? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward once you break it down. But again, practice will make perfect. Yes? Um, that control, where is that on the... the matching control? The matching control, it's the diamond one. So if you look at your third, the third section, the accounting one, notice how it says they match it? Yeah, okay. Now, fourth one was the approval of the payment. Here we go. Payment approved. Again, guys, approved. Has to be evidence of approval. So you would take a sample of the payments and again, you would check, check that there was evidence of approval. Now again, if you start checking the amount against the sales invoice, you're again, you're doing substantive, okay? You've got to be really mindful of the focus that you have. So evidence of approval. Again, is it a signature? Now mind you, again, because we're doing more IT focused activities these days, evidence can be in the form of a manual signature or a digital signature. So that's also something that you see. Now, a digital signature, usually it's a digital stamp. So it says when uh, the manager or whoever the person was, when they approved it, the date and the time. All right? In saying that, again, this links back to what we mentioned earlier for the first control, make sure it was by the right person. So you want to go back to the authority limits, make sure it was the right person who approved it. Again, if it was just a junior that ticked off on it, probably not a good control. Right? It's not operating effectively unless it's been approved by the right person. Okay? Guys, use this as your practice. Use it as a practice. All right? Now, as I mentioned earlier, these tests can become substantive tests as soon as you start going to the detail, looking at quantities, looking at dollar amounts and matching those elements. Vouching, tracing, they're the key terminology you often use. We test the transaction. Okay? Now the final, I'm just going to touch on audit sampling today um, because I will deal with this in greater detail next week. And we have discussed this before. Um, hmm, I might look at this from a conceptual way just to get you to start thinking about it. But ladies and gentlemen, this is a population, okay? In audit, we often take a sample. Remember, the definition of a sample is it's a, if you did statistics, you'll remember this, a sample is a subset of the whole population. So if you're looking at every single person in Australia and we take this class, you're a sample of that population. You're a smaller group within that population. Now in audit, we often take a sample. Listen very carefully to this. We take a sample, we conduct our testing based on the sample 
and we, here's the word, we project our conclusions onto the whole population. Projection is the key word, and I'll emphasize that again next week when we go through this in greater detail. What does projection mean? You take your conclusions and you apply them onto the whole population. Remember, we don't test the whole population because if you think of organisations such as Telstra or uh, Woolworths or Ikea, any of these types of retail organised, McDonald's, they have millions upon millions of transactions every single day. So for a lot of reasons, we don't, take a, uh, so we don't test the whole population because number one, it's too expensive. Number two, it would take too much time. And guys, number three, sometimes you just can't. It's impossible to go and test every single item. You can't test every single sales transaction at McDonald's. It's because of these reasons that we opt to take a sample. We calculate, or sorry, we do all our testing based on the sample and we project the results onto the population. Now, what's really important is this concept. The concept is called representative sample, okay? We need to make sure that the sample we have taken is what's called representative of the population. What does that mean? It means it shares the same characteristics as the whole population. Let me give you an example. So if I was to do a study on the number of students, on the whole, the whole cohort of students studying this subject this semester, and I picked three students as my sample, and it was three, these three lovely gentlemen at the front, Based on my sample, I would conclude that, well, because all three members of my sample are male, that means that everyone studying this subject is male. Ladies and gentlemen, is that conclusion correct? Ladies? No, seriously, you've got to say no. Is it? No, okay, good. <laughs> now that, guys, that's what we call sampling risk. It's the risk that your conclusion is wrong because your, your sample did not represent the population. It was not what we call representative of the population. So in order to increase the chance that your conclusion will be accurate, you need to make sure that you pick a sample that represents the population well, right? Now, there's a, you can read this particular um, article. It's about an Aussie breakfast habits um, and like a new breakfast thing that they want to introduce. But in getting to the testing results, the sample that they took should have included people from different age categories, at different wages or salaries, different genders, different locations within Australia and so on and so forth. Why? Because by making sure that they have these characteristics, they represent the population much more clearly. Okay? And that means that the results of the test is more accurate. All right, so that's really important. Now remember, if your sample does not represent the population well, then it's a risk that your conclusion will be wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, that is called sampling risk. Sampling risk is the risk that your conclusion will be incorrect or inaccurate because your sample didn't represent the population, okay? So if I said that everyone was male because my sample of three students was male. So in order to deal with that, you need to make sure that your sample has the same characteristics as the population to prevent um, sampling risk. Now, you notice one more thing. We have non-sampling risk. Ladies and gentlemen, non-sampling risk means the risk of you getting an incorrect conclusion for any reason other than your sample, right? For example, you made a mistake, okay? So both of these risks are risks that your conclusion is wrong. But sampling risk is the risk your conclusion is wrong because your sample was bad. Non-sampling risk is your conclusion was wrong for any other reason. So the people performing the audit, uh, there was a lot of human error. They were tired, they were hungover, whatever the, the case may be, they reached the wrong conclusions based, or they, the, they did the testing wrong, for example, right? So it's any other reason other than your sample, okay? Now, there are two, there are two types of sampling. And given what I want to take you through next week, it makes more sense for me to just leave this and discuss it with you next week. So for now, all I want you to know is we have two types of samples or sampling. We have statistical and non-statistical. Statistical, non-statistical. Now you might be noticing, well, what's probabilistic and non-probabilistic? First of all, can we please recognize that I can say probabilistic and non-probabilistic? Um, the key thing I want to tell you is they actually mean the same thing. But what I would like you to learn and focus on 
is statistical and non-statistical. So we won't refer to probabilistic or non-probabilistic, -prob we'll just refer to them as statistical and non-statistical. Have a read of this for now, but I will delve into detail with this at the beginning of next week's class. Okay, it's gonna make more sense and I'll take you through all the detail of it. You've been wonderful. Have a fantastic week. I will see you next time. Good job, everyone.